Good evening. Namaste. Welcome everybody to today's class on Jesus Christ, his life and his teachings. Since we are meeting for the first time in this new year, wishing you all a very, very happy new year and a happy master's birthday, which we just left behind. And of course, a happy Lodi and a happy Makar Sakranti that are coming up a very auspicious time of the year. As now we uh, come to the ascendant where the sun goes up, uh, the six months of the rising sun, according to the astral universe, as well as the physical universe. So let us begin our class with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lehri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Beloved Gurudev, Paramhansa Yogananda Ji, Friend and Guide, Swami Kriyananda Ji, Saints and Sages of all religions, Humbly we bow at thy feet. Dear Lord, O infinite Christ, present in the body of Jesus and in all of us, manifest thyself in the ascents of thy glory, in the strength of thy light and in the power of thy infinite wisdom. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let us invoke the presence of the Gurus now by singing the hymn to Brahma, followed by a chant. <laughs> Christ. Let us invoke him in his infinite consciousness, as Master would say, cloud-colored Christ. So let the formless Christ dawn upon us. Let's call him with all our love. <laughs> Cloud 
colored Christ come. Oh, my cloud colored Christ come. Cloud colored Christ come. Oh, my cloud colored Christ Let's go inwards and feel the presence of the Lord within us. Feel that he is pulsating through our arteries, through our heart. He's sending electrical signals from our brain to various parts of our body and receiving electrical signals from the sensory world around. He is digesting the food that you ate in the afternoon. He is doing the planning through your thought system, through your mind. He is breathing through your body. He is smiling through you. Acknowledge that the power and life that flow through you belong to the one power, God. And it is the reflection of the one infinite God, the Father, that exists in us and enlivens us. And that is the Son, the Christ consciousness. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the sound of Om, by communing through that, 
we can see the reflected Christ consciousness that is within us. Let us now hear a few thoughts about security by Swami Kriyananda. Man struggles all his life to store up treasures for himself, to ensure his property against loss and his health against the devastations of disease. He rests his faith in outward measures and sees not that such faith is like asking a wave not to move. Security is his alone whose faith rests in the Lord. Most practical of men is he who offers his life to God, praying, My safety is thy responsibility, Lord. This does not mean we should not be conscientious, but after doing our very best, we should leave the worrying to God. Let us do the following affirmation multiple times with deep conviction of our heart, our mind, and our body. I live in the fortress of God's inner presence. Nothing and no one can break through these walls and harm me. I live in the fortress of God's inner presence. Nothing and no one can break through these walls and harm me. I live in the fortress of God's inner presence. Nothing and no one can break through these walls and harm me. Mentally follow this prayer. I accept whatever comes, Lord, as coming from thy hands. I know that it comes in blessing, for I am thine as thou art ever mine. Om. Peace. Amen. So my dear friends, we now come to the story section of our class. And today I have brought out a story. It's an ancient story. And it is uh, the school of Advaita Vedanta uses this story very commonly to uh, tell you where, who you are and where your sense of happiness lies and where it should lie. Okay. So I'll just read out this story. It's called The Princess of Kashi. It's very amusing. It's very uh, provoke, thought-provoking. And then, of course, as always, it ends with a moral. So you can just be uh, calm and quiet, go inwards and go into the 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 beauty as well as the, the moral of the story. Okay. Long, long ago in a kingdom in India, a play was being staged in the royal court. It was called The Princess of Kashi. The role of the Princess of Kashi was to be played by a little girl. Since there was no little girl in that palace, the queen thought that the prince, who was five at that time, could be dressed up as a girl and play that role. It wasn't a big role and all the prince had to do was to stand there. So he was dressed as a princess. He looked so adorable as a princess that the queen ordered a painting to be made of him. When the painting was done, the artist brushed in the words, the princess of Kashi at the bottom and he also put a date to it. After some years, the painting was taken down to the palace cellar and stored there. By now, the prince was a young man of 20. He was good-looking, confident, smart, and was being trained in the affairs of the state. One day, while wandering through the palace, he found a set of stairs leading to the cellar and decided to explore what was in there. He chanced upon a painting of a little girl dressed up in royal garb. Underneath was written, the Princess of Kashi. 
Looking at the date, he realized that the princess would be the same age as he. She was so pretty that the prince fell in love with her. He decided he would marry no one but her. Like any young man in love, he became dreamy and preoccupied with thoughts of the princess of Kashi. He lost his focus on his princely activities and responsibilities. The king and queen noticed the change in his mood and behavior and were concerned. When they asked him what was wrong, he was too shy to tell them. Finally, a kind old minister met the prince and asked him, What's wrong, son? Why are you not yourself these days? After gently assuring the prince that he would keep his secret, the minister was able to coax a reply out of the prince. I'm in love, said the prince bashfully. Oh, that's great news, said the minister. Who is she? Where is she? She is the princess of Kashi. I saw a painting of her in the royal cellar. The date of the painting shows that she would be 20 years old, just like me, and I want to marry her. On hearing these words, the minister fell silent and started to think. He knew he had heard of the princess of Kashi before, but couldn't remember where and when. So he asked, can you please show me this painting? The prince took him down to the royal cellar. When the minister saw the painting, he immediately recognized who the princess was. Placing his hand on the prince's shoulder, the kind-hearted minister looked him in the eye and said in a serious tone, Well, I have to tell you something. What is it? asked the prince, sensing that something was amiss. You can't marry this girl, said the minister. But why? the prince asked, alarmed. Is she already married? Is she dead? The minister then told him the story of the play that was staged 15 years ago and how he, the prince, was dressed up as a girl and made to play the role of the princess of Kashi. Dear prince, you can't marry her because you are the princess of Kashi. The prince staggered back in shock and bewilderment as he heard the minister's words. On realizing the truth that the princess of Kashi didn't exist and that he himself was what he was yearning for, his desire for the princess melted away instantly. The writer of the story goes on to explain. Vedanta explains that because we take ourselves to be individuals, separate from each other and the world, we live with a sense of duality, that is I and the world. Moreover, since we all have an innate desire to be happy and we don't experience happiness within us, we naturally look out to the world outside for the happiness that we seek. But the problem is that the outer world has no real happiness. After all, you do experience happiness from the outer world. So what does this really mean? For instance, you feel happy when you are able to acquire and enjoy something you want or when you are in the company whom you like or in a situation that pleases you. While you do feel happy in these situations, it is not the true happiness that you seek. This is because you don't just want to be happy some of the time and you don't just want to be somewhat happy. What you want is to be absolutely happy and all the time. The happiness that comes from your contact with the world is impermanent, uncertain, and tinged with a subtle undercurrent of fear. You experience fear because your happy state of mind depends on things, on people, on situations, remaining in a way that suits your particular wants and needs. Yet you know that it is impossible because nothing ever stays the same. True happiness is absolute, permanent and independent of any external and constantly changing factors. What's interesting is that even though we never find the real happiness that we seek in the outer world, we just can't seem to give up searching for it. 
we seem to be programmed with a desire to find permanent happiness. So coming back to the point of the story, Vedanta argues that if the outer world does not have any intrinsic happiness, then the only other place that it can be is within me. In fact, not only is real happiness within me, it is me. It is my true nature. I am not the personality whom I take myself to be. I am pure spirit or the self. My nature is absolute happiness, unconditioned by any outer thing, being or circumstance. But strangely, I've forgotten it. There is, however, a deep inner knowing always that doesn't go away. That's why I never give up or I never tire of seeking happiness. What I'm trying is basically to reclaim my own true nature. The most stunning teaching of Vedanta demonstrated by this story is that in reality, there is no duality. The world which I superimpose happiness on doesn't really exist, just as the princess of Kashi doesn't exist. What I'm searching for really is me, myself, and there is no other world apart from my true self. This is a story worth pondering. And we must introspect all the time that where is my sense of happiness? The fact that I can enjoy an ice cream is because there is something in me which is able to enjoy the ice cream. The day that I'm feeling sick, suppose my bodily health is not good, that day I cannot enjoy the ice cream because the ability to enjoy which lies within me has dimmed because of the superimposition of bodily sickness. Similarly, if I'm in too much mental stress, again, then I'm not going to enjoy the ice cream. Why? The ice cream remains the same. But my ability to enjoy it reduces because my mind has other distractions to work upon. So if we closely uh, introspect and watch the world with alertness and my reactions to the world with alertness, I will find that happiness is not the character of things outside me. No particular thing or person or situation has an innate happiness to it. It is not the property or quality of that thing or situation. So then where does the happiness come from? It comes from within me. It is my ability to enjoy the world. And why is it? Why is there my ability to enjoy the world? Because I am made of the joy of the one who has created me. And that is why that joy lies within me. And with that joy, when it flows out into the world, it is able to enjoy the world. But the problem with the world is that it is made of duality. Every pleasure that I seek in the world will have to be balanced by pain. And therefore, I must eventually withdraw into myself using the power of the Guru's teaching and Kriya Yoga. And then from there, can I truly see who I am? And from that right perspective, knowing that I am the pure self and pure spirit, controlling my senses, putting my mind in my own control, then can I truly enjoy this life and this world. Otherwise, it's going to be a net of suffering. Okay. So again, our humble request for everybody to introspect on this teaching, on this story, that the happiness that we seek outside is within us. Now we come back to the study of our New Testament and we continue our journey there. And uh, uh, just a little recap of what we've done so far in two minutes before we move on. So uh, we remember studying that how uh, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist and he begins his ministry. Uh, before he begins his ministry, he actually goes to the Mount of Temptations where he fasts for 40 days and there Satan tempts him with various things. But Jesus becomes victorious and he asks Satan to leave him and to get behind him. And thus conquering the satanic influences, when he descends the Mount of Temptations, he starts to collect his disciples uh, like John and like James and Andrew and Philip. And as he's collecting his disciples, the first miracle that he has to perform is demanded of his mother when in a wedding, the host is short of wine. So Jesus there converts water into wine. 
and then he moves on and he carries his collects more disciples and then uh, the story says that the the festival of passover comes in jerusalem and everybody goes to jerusalem jesus with few of his disciples goes there and there as he enters the temple and he sees the businesses and the merchants working he gets angry and he uh, just throws away the money of the money changers and he just who throws away the tables and then the people challenge him that if you claim to be the messiah then why don't you show us a miracle show us a sign and to this jesus does not reply with a miracle but he says you destroy this temple in uh, temple now and i will rebuild in 3 days and as we know that people do not understand what he's saying they think we've made the temple in 46 years how can you rebuild in 3 days but later the disciples understand that he means the temple is his body and then as he is uh, doing his sermon in the in in the temple of jerusalem one of the priests high priest named nicodemus who feels the power of jesus but he is too shy to approach jesus during the daytime so at night nicodemus approaches jesus and jesus uh, knows that he is a receptive disciple so jesus tells him that you must be twice born if you want to be to know really know the lord it is not important to just hold a social religious position but to have the first experience of god and for that you have to be twice born meaning that you have to not only be born in the body but you have to be reborn in spirit in the holy ghost so only then will you realize and then also he explains that uh, how the people who believe in in the lord and his son are uh, redeemed and people who do not believe are condemned already because they are limited to themselves and they think they are these little uh, humans and they forget their divine nature and then he also goes on to say to nicodemus that how that there is light in the world but people who love darkness people who are already involved in evil deeds they do not want to leave the darkness they are, they do not want to go into the light because they know if they go into the light their deeds will be exposed and they are too ashamed to face them and they cover that shame you know with not wanting to go towards the light but the light exists always amongst us in inside of us and then parallelly we find that someone is reporting all of these affairs to john the baptist on the other side of the town and john the baptist is very happy to hear that the ministry of jesus is now expanding and then he explains to his the people around him that how jesus the son of god is the bridegroom and then how the world and we discussed this last class what it means to be the bridegroom and the bride so this the own vibration and the world that has come out of it is is the bride and the the christ consciousness is the bridegroom and then john the baptist says that he is the son of god and whoever will believe him believe in him will attain everlasting life okay. so now we move on with the story and says after god announced the coming of jesus through john and showed to the pharisees the magnetic drawing power of jesus uh, attracting crowds of soul bees by divine fragrance manifested in him jesus left judea and departed for galilee to preach there the gospel he had a special mission to redeem a fallen disciple of former incarnation the woman of samaria that it was why it was written and he must needs go through samaria so as we discussed some time earlier there were main three districts in the in the region of israel one is judea one is galilee and one is samaria and samaria and the samaritans the people who live there are supposed to be a relatively lowly people uh, as compared to the jews that live in jerusalem but jesus has a fallen disciple of past incarnations there and therefore as he goes from judea towards galilee he takes a you know a, a different circuit he takes his disciples there and he has to visit samaria and it has been prophesized much earlier like the other prophecies that when the messiah comes he will travel through samaria okay so now i will read the gospel of john the exact words and then we'll try and understand what this says then cometh he to a city of samaria which is called sicha near to the parcel of ground that jacob gave to his son joseph okay so the uh, the 
words Jacob and Joseph. These were basically uh, prophets which are uh, shown in the Old Testament. So if we, Old Testament is about the descendant of man from Adam and Eve and then all through the descendants of Abraham and his children, Isaiah and Isaac and then Joseph. And that's, there's a whole lineage before Jesus is born. In fact, a whole lineage before King David, King Solomon and all of them are born. So this reference of Jacob and Joseph comes from the Old Testament. And it is said that in the area where now Samaria was, uh, the jo Joseph and Jacob lived that area and Jacob had given that land to the Joseph. So in, for, by initially by the Jews, the land was considered a sacred land, but now it was under the district of Samaria and not very respected area of the place. Okay, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have given me, thou wouldst have given thee living water. Okay. So very interesting, these last words. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have given thee living water. So we'll understand each word of it. So Master explains here that the meeting of Jesus with the woman of Samaria was no chance encounter. It was definitely crafted by Jesus who was following the orders from the heavenly father. And he, the woman of Samaria was his fallen disciple from past incarnations. And he had come specially to redeem her, to uplift her. As with many great masters, Jesus had among his following a number of disciples from past lives. The guru disciple covenant they had established in previous lifetimes drew them together again by the unseen magnetism of divine law. Here, all of us should introspect and ask ourselves, is it just for chance that Yoganandaji Nandaji came into our life? Or is there a divine covenant between us and our guru that he has promised us to, to walk by us till we uh, are free in eternity? And don't you feel that a familiarity with your guru? Don't you feel... That when you practice the techniques by, given by Yogananda or you, if you read the teachings given by Yogananda, doesn't it ring in your heart? Doesn't there, is there not a frequency which just resonates? So if that is true, if we feel uh, so much you know, affinity, attraction towards Yogananda, it is of course true that it is no chance encounter that he has come into our life. He was supposed to come back to us as a disciple and he will be with us till we actually find our freedom in eternity. And uh, Sri Yukteswarji has mentioned somewhere that the guru never leaves the disciple alone and especially when the disciple is going through a troubled time. So uh, looking back into our lives, we know that when, when our boat was rocking on the waves of the sea of life, definitely at that point in time, one of the most difficult of times sometimes uh, that where we were feeling alone, you know, it is not necessarily that outwardly things were very difficult, but in our hearts somewhere, when we were feeling alone, that is the time the guru just he knocked at our door again, and he hold, held our hand, and he's again walking with us and um, protecting us. Okay. 
Uh, also, past life incarnation disciples, Master says, it is not just that Jesus had just 12 main disciples. In fact, the, the 12 disciples were the inner circle. Then there was another outer circle where some of the New Testament uh, commentaries say there were about 70 to 77 people in that. And again, of course, there was this bigger, larger fo following behind him who were not so much in tune with the teaching of, of Jesus, but were attracted by him. Because not only because of his power and of course the miracles that he was doing, he was healing so many people. Jesus recognized those disciples who were continuing the relationship they had began with him in a former life, as distinguished from those who were coming to him for the first time for enlightenment. It is for the sake of the unredeemed that the Guru must come back to earth. By taking human incarnation or by appearing in vision to guide and bless those who are in tune, or sometimes even by using the instrumentality of another qualified master, the God-ordained savior continues to help his disciples when their own efforts permit him to do so until all are finally liberated. So a very important point here is the Guru is always wanting to save us. But when their own efforts permit him to do so. So are we open to receive the help of the master? Or are we just happy in our worldly life, this, this mesh of you know seeking happiness and pleasure from this world? Are we happy with that? Or are we want, willing to make that effort of knowing the higher power that is within us? It is only when our heart is open, our mind is open, and we are willing to put in the extra energy and effort, will the guru be able to help us? So unless a student is ready, a teacher cannot get through the student. So what is our job then? The 25% of the duty of the disciple is to be in readiness always, is to be alert, is to be aware, is to be in the company of truth seekers, is to listen to the, the teachings of the guru, to keep practicing. If we practice our technique of Kriya Yoga regularly, then we are attuning ourselves to that ray of light that master has brought for us, which is going to free us. But if we block, like Jesus said, there is light, but people want, do not want to see the light. So master is ever present always, but are we ready to receive the light? And remember, receiving the light means hard work. You have to attune yourself to receive the light. But once you receive the light, you know that nothing of this world will taste as sweet as being in that light. So let's, let's keep ourselves open. Let's be sincere to the teachings and let's follow for our own best benefit. If we want to be free, who else is going to work for us? Of course, the guru. Yes, but besides that, no one in the world is bothered about our freedom. So might as well we be bothered and do the right thing at the right time. Okay. No matter what the degree of advancement, disciples once accepted by a true guru hold a secure place in that relationship as they gradually progress and oftentimes falter incarnation after incarnation. So yes, so there are two sides of the coin says once you are accepted by the guru he will never leave you but then you will you can falter and still therefore it takes few incarnations to get yourself outside uh, out the mesh that we are living in okay the woman of samaria was one such disciple who had faltered it appears that during his trip from judea to galilee jesus purposely planned this meeting waiting alone at Jacob's well, where the woman would be likely to encounter him while the disciples went into the city to obtain food. Contrary to the prevailing attitude at that time that Samaritans were shunned by the Jews as low caste, Jesus engaged the woman in conversation and asked her to draw water for him. Christ did not see people in terms of their race, creed, or social position. He saw the divine in all. To Jesus, no one was a stranger. He loved unconditionally and gorged individuals solely by their inner qualifications, their spiritual sincerity, and receptivity to truth. When he said, 
if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Jesus was hinting to the woman that God had blessed her in previous incarnations with the greatest of all gifts, a divine savior who had followed her to this life to redeem her. Jesus sought to stir her dormant memory of the past. Thus he intimated that if she but knew that it was her God-given guru who was asking for the drink, she would hasten to ask him for the living water of God contact. So now the gospel continues. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. This water means the well's water. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So now Master explains the meaning of this verse. Jesus speaks of inner experience. That how uh, with the help of one's guru, the inner living water can be uncovered. So the inner living water is that uh, communion with spirit. Spirit is everlasting. Spirit is absolute. Spirit is infinite and it is eternal. So if we are able to touch the source of who we really are, then we also tend to develop those qualities, which is everlasting, infinity, eternity, absoluteness. And that is what Jesus is trying to convey to her, that the water that you drink in this physical universe can quench your physical thirst, but only for a time. But if you drink the water that I have to give you, then that will quench your thirst forever. Means that does not mean, of course, the body till it lives has to feel thirsty and the thirst will be quenched by the physical water. But the, the thirst of desire, unfulfilled desires, that will be quenched forever if even once we have that contact with Christ consciousness. If once we feel that God and the Guru are always within us and around us, protecting us, then we need not look towards the world for security. We need not look towards the world for a conditioned kind of happiness, uh, an impermanent happiness. Then we know that we need to go within and that for that our Savior the Guru and Jesus is also one of our Gurus. They have come as avatars to save us, to redeem us. And we might as well use this opportunity to the best of our capability. Oblivious of the all-sustaining, all-desire-quenching divine life that lies within his soul, the material man dies unfulfilled. unfulfilled. His yearnings remain with him even after death, a latent thirst that will impel him to reincarnate again and yet again in search of satisfaction. So we must remember this. If our desires are not quenched now, then those desires as energy vortices remain in our astral spine. And even when at death the body is shed away, we the consciousness with our causal and astral bodies with those imbued vortices of energy will need to have another body so that those vortices are quietened so that we move from duality to absoluteness so but the kriya the power of kriya yoga has to be clearly understood here that how it can loosen the hold of those energy vortices that are present in our astral spine and how it can release those vortices into the infinite. So if we are practicing Kriya Yoga, then we needn't worry. If we love God and the Guru enough and we practice his teachings, then automatically the, those vrittis that are there in us, which are definitely there, the fact that we are living in a body on this planet means we've had past unfulfilled desires, means that there is, there is some work to be done. But now the Guru has given us the key to the kingdom of God. We must use it wisely and release all those unfulfilled desires into the love 
and joy of the infinite. Whosoever drinks of the fountain of eternal bliss in God will find the thirst of every desire of all the incarnations quenched forever. Souls who discover the everlasting well of bliss within them are never thirsty for the evanescent satisfactions of a mortal existence and its material desires. So uh, one of the signs of progress in spiritual life is that your thirst for uh, you know, worldly pleasures start to starts to decrease. I wouldn't say it just vanishes overnight. But yes, if you look back on your life uh, before you joined the spiritual path and now on the spiritual path, you know that what interests you more every Sunday morning, what interests devotees more is to be in the company of other devotees, is to listen to the satsang that is given by our leaders like Jyotish and Deviji, like Swamiji, like Master, like the great gurus. We just love that more than we love going to the mall or going to the, you know, watching a movie or just being with our worldly friends. So that is a kind of testimony in itself that we are, our energy is being withdrawn into our own self towards our center and we should be happy about it. And that's a sign of spiritual progress. Okay, so now the story continues and the gospel continues. The woman saith unto him, Sir, Give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In, in that thou saidst truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So what is happening here? So Jesus comes to this woman, asks her to draw some water. And, uh, and he says that I can give you eternal water which will quench your eternal thirst. And this water will quench your physical thirst. And so the woman says, okay, give me that eternal water. I want that. And he says, okay, go and bring your husband. And then she says, but I have no husband. And then Jesus tells her, you are saying rightly, because I know that you have had five husbands in the past. And the man that you are living with now is not your husband. And you have been true in that sense. So master says here that uh, a flicker of receptivity awoke in the disciple. Now she wanted to have that water which has it on her life. But then Jesus tested her. So again, all of these stories will take us back, should take us back into ourself. To, you know, are we are going to be tested. So tested means how loyal we are. How much faith do we have in God? We are going to be tested by some small trials and some big trials. But if we steadfastly stick to the truth and be sincere in our own heart, then nothing can stop us from having that eternal life because it is God himself who wants to give that eternal life to us because we are his loving children. Okay. So Master says, a flicker of receptivity stirred in the woman. So Jesus tested the character of his fallen disciple, the degree of her degradation. He asked her to call her husband and when she said that she has no husband, he was pleased with her truthfulness, in tacitly admitting that the man with whom she was presently coupled was not a lawful spouse. Jesus then reveals that he knew of her promiscuous behavior in having had five such illicit relationships. Rather than lying to defend her, she recognized Jesus as a divine prophet who alone could have known her secret. In this moment of spiritual submission, Jesus saw the genuine quality of her sincerity. Her immortality lay like a clay crust over her pure, truth-loving soul, hiding it only temporarily. Her mortality, sorry. So same is the fact for us. So we are all immortal souls and God and the Guru know that. But what lies over it is a crust, 
some layers have formed over our pure eternal infinite soul and those layers are of our desires of our attachments of our likes of our dislikes of of getting stuck in this world thinking that this is the only happiness that i have that this is the only possibility for me now so misunderstanding and ignorance a crust of ignorance is formed over the soul which is the body mind complex and jesus can see through that crust and see that this is a pure soul who is in love with god who is a sincere truthful person and it would do her best to redeem her so the guru and god are always merciful and kind we should not we should never doubt that they are they are not thinking of us or they are not worried about us in fact just in the world as in worldly life the teacher is sometimes more worried than the child for his success the parents are more worried than the, the child for his or her success similarly the guru is always more interested in our success than even we know because we don't know what lies beyond the physical world but he knows and he wants us to be with him there in sincerity master says now he warns all of us he says in sincerity prevarication and uh, treachery toward a guru preceptor are devastating sins for these are deliberate willful transgressions and as such are worse evils than flesh transgressions which to a considerable extent are due to instinctive compulsion now this is a very very important warning so guru is warning us to the mental level he says physical transgressions are somewhat instinctive because we have kind of coming from the animal behavior we have the body like that of a similar to that of an animal being so because there are certain instincts and therefore physical transgressions may happen but they are not as bad as spiritual transgressions so if you are in in your mind uh, and what is a spiritual transgression it of course non loyalty to the guru is one but being scattered in yourself is a spiritual transgression if you are not focused enough if you are not going towards you once you having realized what the goal should be if you are not going towards the goal and yet you are you know busy with this fair of life then this is a spiritual transgression because you have been shown the way you have been given the key but now also you are reluctant you don't want to move your energy you don't want to use your will power and you still want to stay where you are so that is in a sense you are you know kind of disappointing the guru he will he will never leave you by leave by your side he will always be there but uh, let us not disappoint him let us he said once that now he wants race horses he is fed up of tortoises so now we must check within ourselves are we spiritual tortoises or are we spiritual race horses once that we know that our freedom lies in realizing our immortality and the presence of god within us then what are we doing now with our life are we wasting our time each moment is precious or are we actually working towards our goal okay some persons owing to immoral behavior in a past life are born with a compelling inclination that overrules all sense of sense of shame or threats or conscience so this if you have the fact that we have found the guru in this life that means at least there is some sincerity in our heart we have in our hearts truly yearned for freedom truly yearned for immortality and ever new joy that the guru has come to us otherwise it is said that many incarnations are lost in between when the guru does not physically come by our side or actively you do not recognize the presence of the guru in your life so the fact that guru has like a magic wand he has put on your head and he has awakened you to his presence means that there is sincerity now let us rekindle let the let the light be lighted means there is a flame in our heart of sincerity of love of yearning how bright is that flame shining is the question now how much oil are we putting in how much effort how much love are we putting in that will determine how much the guru can help us in this lifetime and can we become a jivan mukta in this lifetime or not is all determined by how bright that flame of love of the guru disciple relationship of the god devotee relationship how bright is that light burning the disciple who is insincere towards his guru in attempting to hide or rationalize his moral disease shuts out the healing help of the master in any case hypocritical evasion 
or false reasoning does not work with the guru because he is not deceived no matter how cunning the disciple. The master can perceive the inmost character of the disciple exactly and immediately. Even when a guru accepts a disciple who later exhibits evil or treacherous tendencies, it is not because the master was unknowing. So for example, the, the 12th disciple or Judas is Iscariot. So it's not that Jesus did not know that Judas is going to uh, be transgressing and he's going to be uh, failing him. But still, there was some good in the past of Judas' life, some sincerity there that Jesus actually accepted him as his disciple. And then, of course, the drama unfolded as we will study how it did. When a guru sees the soul of a disciple fallen in ignorance, his God-given duty and heartfelt concern leave no choice to him but help him. So just like when the you know, our children are falling or going the wrong way or going into difficult circumstances, the parent knows. But the parent has no choice but to side by the child. Similarly, God the father, God our mother is the closest. He is us. He has no choice but to keep helping us because he can see our plight. The, the plight that we ourselves can't see, God and the Guru can see our plight and they are so compassionate that they want to help us. So they have no choice but to help the disciple. Every soul can be rescued, no matter how entangled in error. If the mind makes a genuine commitment to cooperate spiritually, the Guru provides repeated opportunities for the disciple to make his breakthrough from ignorance. So look at the love of the Guru. He will give you opportunity again and again. Okay, he'll say, oh, this time you have not understood. Don't worry. Try this. Try that. He will keep pestering you in a sense, thankfully, that unless you awaken to his presence, unless you awaken to the presence that the divine is within you, that Christ is always present, no, not barring any space and any time. The Guru will keep giving you repeated opportunities. Though one sin be as deep as the ocean, still he can be saved if he is sincere and loyal to his master, linking himself with the channel that draws him to God. Okay, so now uh, the question arises, uh, we know the answer, but yes, let's address that. How did Jesus know about all the past lives of, uh, of the Samaritan woman? How could he just point it out? So he is, again, we are brought to the science of yoga here. We know that the mind has many layers, the subconscious, the conscious, the superconscious, then of course, uh, uh, Christ consciousness, then cosmic consciousness. So Christ is one with the infinite universe at all points in time and space. And since that is the case, it is not difficult for him to access what is stored in the subconscious mind of that woman. And he can instantly, at as Master says, immediately and instantly he can recognize, he can see the life of the devotee just like a picture show and he just knows. And the best thing is, that even when he can see all the faults of his disciples, the guru accepts him. He does not judge. He just loves. He only wants you to reflect in your own self. He, if he can show you the picture of your life, it's not because he is judging you. But he just wants you to recognize that where you are going wrong. So he stands like a mirror. The guru is a mirror in which you know we can see your own reflection and you can Help, ask him for help to correct all the misgivings, the misconceptions that you have in that reflection. If a person holds his mind absolutely still, free from oscillation of any restless thoughts, then he can reflect within him the thoughts that pass through the consciousness of another person. This is only possible when one is versed in the art of subduing his own thinking for any desired length of time. So on the clean slate of the consciousness of the master is like a photograph, the life 
the thoughts, the emotions of another person can be reflected. So if now if we remember the stories that are given in the autobiography and the new path where master just knew every thought of each of his disciples. How was he able to do that? Because at will, he was a master. Master means a complete control on your own mind and body. So he, at his own will, he could subdue, he could control his thoughts and become that clean slate on which the other thoughts, the projection of those thoughts can be reflected and he can just see them clearly. And in fact, he would say that each night uh, through his consciousness, he passes through the consciousness of all his disciples and that, and he also commented that he's happy to see that so many disciples are progressing on the spiritual path. So don't think that since the master is not in body now, he is not passing through our consciousness. He now also clearly now. knows. Jesus clearly knows exactly what we are thinking. What are our intentions behind those thoughts? What are the emotions that are associated with those thoughts? What are our inherent desires? What are our attachments? They know it all. Now, it's best that with introspection, we try to see clearly. And then from there, we try to offer all of those imperfections that we have into the light of God. And each night, Swamiji said, you must uh, build a virtual fire in your mental sky and cast your attachments, cast your desires, cast, cast your likes and dislikes, all the petty things that we are in life that keep us to mortality and finitude cast all of them into that fire and then surrender your life into the hands of the Lord. And then after that, only you must go to sleep. And the next morning when you wake up, you are a clean slate. Of course, it takes many of such offerings and many of such nights, but it is going to happen sooner or later, it is going to happen. So don't think that it is not possible with you. Yes, because Jesus was in front of that lady. Therefore, it was possible for her or it was possible for him to see her thoughts. We are all the same. We are all, uh, the guru is looking over all of us equally. God is looking over all of us. So it will do best that we offer our life and all the associated paraphernalia with it at his holy feet, that we invite his love consciously and that we love him with all our heart, mind, body, and soul. With that thought, my dear friend, friends, we'll end today's class and let us share uh, the blessings that we have received and the power of these teachings with all souls everywhere. Let us pray together. Divine Mother, beloved Lord Jesus, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest thy healing presence in all bodies, all minds, and all souls. Oh. Oh. Divine Mother, beloved Lord Jesus, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion and may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you, dear friend.